All righty. The first Caesar of Rome was? Shout it out. Thank you, not quite. First Caesar was the first Caesar, Julius. Then Augustus, then Tiberius, then Caligula, then. See, you're getting this. This is good. You're doing well. All right, so we have Claudius. We talked about him a little bit last week. He was the reluctant emperor who was more or less forced into this position after the death of his nephew, and also the one who had been, in a sense, his master as the emperor uh, Caligula. So here he is, Claudius Caesar. Family life, just briefly, I'm going to go through this fairly rapidly, but hopefully it'll give us a little bit of the texture. He is the brother of Germanicus, and we've talked about Germanicus now on a, two or three occasions. He was, of course, the most popular military character in the Roman world at the time, before his death and Claudius was his brother, and so it gave him pretty good family connections. Claudius is the first emperor to be born outside of Italy. Now, you'll notice that Germanicus, of course, was a military man, and uh, the father of both of them, the father of both Germanicus and Claudius, was also a military man, and a lot of his campaigns were outside of Italy. So that's the reason that Claudius himself was born outside of Italy, but that was still a significant thing. This is the first man who is not native to Italy, even though he certainly is native Roman. But maybe more significant is that he was the first one to take the name Caesar, who had no real family justification for doing so. So we know that his, uh, we know that, uh, for example, uh, Germanicus had a son, uh, Caligula, who was the preceding emperor. Germanicus was married to Agrippina the Elder, who was the granddaughter of Augustus Caesar. And so Caligula actually had a legitimate claim to the name Caesar. And when he called himself Caligula or Gaius Caesar, which is actually the name he preferred, he had a claim to do so. When we get to Claudius, however, there's no family connection there that would justify the use of the name, but he continues to use it, which is a way of saying that by this time, Caesar has now become not simply a family designation, but a title, and it's part of the ongoing usage that, of course, continues for a couple of hundred years. One of the most interesting features of Claudius was that he had some kind of birth defect, apparently, that seems to be the best guess at least, so that throughout his life he walked with a very conspicuous limp and spoke with a notable stammer or stutter. And for that reason, his family was somewhat embarrassed about him. This was part of what foreclosed any military um, sort of leadership for his career. And his family kind of kept him out of the public eye, not that he wasn't competent. He did a lot of things behind the scenes, more or less as a kind of a bureaucrat, but he was not one of these out front sort of characters. Before he became the uh, Caesar, he was generally uh, out of the public eye. In fact, he liked to avoid public exposure, and so we don't hear too much about him. But uh, he was appointed consul under Caligula. Now, that may not mean too much, because you recall Caligula also appointed his horse to be a consul. You remember that? So I don't know if that was viewed by Claudius as a really great, you know, uh, sort of a prestige factor in his life or not, but nevertheless, Caligula did put Claudius, and that was really the most conspicuous kind of public role that he had held up until this time, but he'd done, done a lot of things behind the scenes. He was more of an academic. Claudius was a character who enjoyed book work and, in fact, wrote a history of the Roman Empire, uh, which is lost to us, unfortunately. Uh, there were several of these rather expansive histories of Rome. Livy gives us one of them. Virgil gives us one. There's others that fill in some of the blanks along the way. Uh, apparently, Claudius wrote a very extensive and apparently rather respectable history of the Roman world himself, but uh, over the you know, centuries, somehow or other, it was lost, so we don't have it, and presumably at this time it's not likely to be discovered. He was forced, basically, to become the next emperor by the Praetorians, and you recall the story from last week, 
Caligula had made such a mess of things and was so completely out of control that his own bodyguards assassinated him, and then they took out his immediate family, including his wife, his infant son, and a few others. And as the uncle of Caligula, Claudius was fearful that he also was going to be caught in the crossfire. And as the story goes, he ran into an inner room and he hid behind a heavy drape or a curtain, hoping he wouldn't be discovered. But these praetorians were pretty smart and they found him and pulled back the curtains and Claudius thought, this is it, I'm a dead man. And then he opens his eyes and there they are bowing the knee to him and proclaiming him the next emperor. So that was quite a dramatic uh, change of expectations for him. He didn't really want the job. He did appreciate not being killed. <laughs> but this was, you know, this was sort of like two bad choices here and he wasn't real keen on either one of them. Uh, but uh, if it was a choice between them, he said, okay, okay, I'll be the emperor, you know, if that's what it takes to avoid being stabbed right now. And so the next day, the Senate uh, did, just as a perfunctory matter, confirm this. Uh, the Praetorians really held a lot of the political clout in Rome at that time. And so he became then, in the year 41, the fifth of the Caesars, or the emperors of uh, Rome. He was, however, a quite competent ruler. I think probably historians would concur that next to Augustus, he was the second best of these rulers. He's better than Tiberius, much, much better than Caligula, much better than Nero. And if we just think about the time frame from Caesar up to the end of the uh, city of Jerusalem, then I think people would say generally, he's probably the second best. Uh, if you look er later in time, you have people like Marcus Aurelius, that he would be a pretty good emperor, certain others were good, but, but in terms of the first century, probably Claudius would be right up there as far as his competence is concerned. He immediately implemented significant reforms. Caligula had successfully spent Rome into bankruptcy, wasting it, not leaving beautiful buildings and structures and so on, but just wasting the wealth that accrued to the imperial office, and Claudius immediately began to make repairs in some of these financial strategies, and gradually there was an accumulation of wealth. He also was a, an evidently stable man. The decisions he made were rational decisions, and the people of Rome deeply appreciated what seemed to them like a breath of fresh air after the nightmare they'd been through with Caligula. This wealth he used, at least to some degree, to put up new structures in Rome, new building projects, and of course the Roman people always liked it when some new building was put up that sort of showed the greatness of Rome, and so he did some of that, and again, that won him a fair amount of popular approval. The one negative thing in, Cali in uh, uh, Claudius's career that really, at least in some people's minds, raised a question as to whether he was an appropriate ruler was that he had no military experience at all because of his uh, impairments. He had never been a proper, you know, a, a either soldier or general or any such thing. And so he'd always been more or less in the bureaucratic side of governance. And it was problematic because typically people who were the emperor were supposed to have had some kind of military experience, even Caligula, as modest as it was, had a little bit of military experience in his background. Claudius had none. And he was aware of that. He knew that there were some people that weren't sure that he was really up for the job because he'd never been out there on the battlefield, never led forces into battle. And so he took on what was one of the most extraordinary military projects of the entire first century and said he was going to conquer those Britons, you know. You'll remember that Julius Caesar had taken a bite at Britain and gone home. He went across the English Channel, found all these crazy people with painted faces, called them Brits, meaning painted, you know, that was the Latin term. So he gave the island its name, but he went home. These folks were way too wacky for him, and he didn't want to mess with them, and so that was that. And that was the end of any Roman incursion into the British uh, region till Claudius. Claudius assembles a good-sized force. He takes them up north. He leads them. He doesn't send them. He leads them. He's in the front of this. He goes across and actually turns out to be a quite competent military tactician. All of his studies of history, when he wrote that great multi-volume history of Rome, had educated him. He knew how to do it. And so when they went into Britain, he was actually quite competent in arraying his armies against these rather barbarian forces that they found there. And it took about four years, 
But over that period of time, Claudius was able to subdue and bring within the Roman fold that great island of Britain. He didn't go clear up into Scotland. You know, Hadrian's Wall, a century later, demarcated the northern border there. But the bulk of what we would call England came under the control of Rome at that time and remained so until the fall of Rome in 476 AD. For several centuries then, this uh, was, a, was an intact uh, occupation and control of Rome, uh, or a control of Britain from, uh, from Rome. So anyway, that was probably the high point of his career in terms of his public perception. He um, uh, was not responsible for this, but you know in the New Testament we have a reference to the famine that was predicted by a character named Agabus, and we read that text a little bit earlier. Uh, that famine took place in about the year 44, and as far as we can tell, continued to about the year 46. There were three significant famines that touched the Roman world under the reign of Claudius. Famines were not that unusual. This wouldn't be some kind of, uh, you know, climate problem necessarily, but famines did happen. But the one that affected the region we're interested in times pretty well with the biblical record. It seems to have happened about the year 44, continued for a couple of years. It touched central Turkey, down through Syria, through Israel, parts of Egypt, and over into Mesopotamia. All of this, a fairly severe famine, and so when the biblical record indicates to us there was such a famine, we know from independent sources that in fact there was, and that this would be the time frame in which it took place. This, of course, gave rise to what's called the famine visit, in which the Apostle Paul, who had been there in Antioch with Barnabas leading the Gentile church, gets this word through a supernaturally gifted prophet, Agabus, of a coming famine. They gather a um, uh, kind of a, a contribution, I guess you'd say, a gift for the so-called poor saints in Jerusalem. The money is taken to them. And it seems to be at that time that Paul has this private meeting with the apostolic leadership which he alludes to in the book of Galatians. Now, if you're familiar with the controversy here, you may know the terms the Southern Galatian and Northern Galatian theories with respect to the book of Galatians. If, if you're familiar with that, then I'm just gonna tell you up front, if, if you care about it, I take the Southern Galatian view because it is the right view. It's simple enough, you know. But uh, anyway, that the effects of this would, would be the following that the conference that is referred to by Paul in the book of Galatians is the famine visit, not the Jerusalem council. The Jerusalem council is described by Luke, of course, in, Luke chapter, in uh, Acts chapter 15. But if Paul were describing the Jerusalem council in the book of Galatians, that would mean that he was skipping over one of his visits to Jerusalem when in fact, in Galatians, he's emphatic that he's telling you the whole story of every contact he had with the leadership. It would be a breach of his own integrity to have skipped over the famine visit in the recitation he's giving to the Galatians, and that's why I think by process of deduction, based on Paul's integrity, we have to assume it was the earlier visit. You can't necessarily tell that on the face of it, but I think the general evidence would point in that direction. And so that's why I think uh, that's the right view. But it is a, it's a divided point, and you see people on both sides, and good people on both sides, but the better people are on my side. So, you know. All right, so the famine visit uh, takes place in 44, and the famine itself uh, took place in that time frame. In 49, Claudius did indeed drive the Jewish people out of Rome. The only independent reference we have to this is from the Roman historian Suetonius, who writes in the early second century, and he only says one thing about it, one line in all of his writings. He sort of has this paragraph in his writings that's a bunch of sort of independent little bullets describing various independent sort of significant discrete things that Claudius did. And the one that touches this one is mentioned for him in the middle of that paragraph, and it reads as follows, quote, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he expelled them from Rome. So that's it. That's the one independent source we have. Suetonius is certainly not trying to back up the biblical account here. He probably wasn't even aware of it. He's just reporting significant incidents connected to the career of, of, uh, of Claudius. 
One thing this tells us is that it actually happened, at least there's cooperating evidence from outside the New Testament. What it leaves unanswered really is why did it happen? Some have speculated that in the Jewish community in Rome at that time, there was a rabble rouser by the name of Crestus, who was provoking some kind of internal turmoil among the Jewish population in Rome, which was sizable, and Claudius finally, to just get rid of this problem, drives them all out. He doesn't take sides, he just gets rid of them. That's one plausible hypothesis. Some have, however, noticed the, and you notice it yourself, don't you, the interesting similarity between the Latin term Christus and the Greek word Christos, from which we get the word Christ. And it is at least, I think, a hypothetical possibility that Suetonius is conflating the two names, that he was aware of a controversy involving what he calls in the Latin language somebody called Christus, you know, and that that may indeed be a reference to the Christian movement among the Jewish Christians in Rome at the time. Now, this is not by any means proven to anybody's satisfaction. It's a hypothesis, so I simply mention it to you in passing, but it is at least plausible, I think, and interesting to speculate along those lines. We know that the Roman church had been there for some years. Paul did not found the church in Rome. It was already there. We know that. That's clearly the New Testament understanding. Probably the founders of the Church of Rome were the people that had been in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Because, in fact, Luke tells us people were there from Rome, among other places. And they would have been converted and would have gone home. And, you know, it's certainly reasonable to assume they would have started a Christian fellowship. And that by 20 years down the road, there might be a sizable number of people who had become members of this largely Jewish Christian church in Rome. That's certainly the implication you draw from Paul's letter to the Romans, written in the year 54, only five years after this, where he talks about this church as having been there for many years, having a worldwide reputation. In other words, it was already a well-established and, and a famous church. And so it's possible that this Reference to Christus is actually a reference to Christ and the Christian movement and the turmoil in the Jewish community in Rome by the year 49 that caused Claudius to just run them all out of town. Now, again, I'm just speculating, but that's a speculation that many have engaged in. Excuse me? All Jews. Yeah, yeah. Claudius didn't care what their particular sectarian alignments were. Just get rid of all these Jewish people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, probably not, probably not. And whether there were Gentile believers in the church at this point would be an unknown question. Certainly at this stage, remember this is quite early. This is, Paul has only just finished his first missionary journey. We've only just barely begun to see Gentiles coming in. So whether in Rome there were Gentile believers, you know, is an open question. But you're right, it'd be ethnic Jews who were driven out Presumably Gentile believers could have stayed put. You know. All right, so anyway, interesting little kind of tidbit there, part of his career. The marriages of Claudius remind you of the marriages of Henry VIII. You know, they're just kind of... This was the one point where the guy wasn't so... Uh, yeah, he had problems. But anyway, the first of his wives, he married her at 18 years old. When he was 18, the year was 9 AD. Her name is Plautia Ergalanila. And there she is. They had two children, neither of which survived. However, Claudius was a little bit unsure of the paternity of the second child. He was enough unsure about it that he finally decided she, he thought she had been, you know, sort of not truly faithful to their marriage covenant, and so he divorced her on charges of infidelity. That took place after about 10 years. That brought his second wife, Aelia Patina, uh, who is this uh, lovely lady. They had one daughter, uh, but she also was uh, suspected by him of being unfaithful, and he divorced her. This brought the third of them, Valerie uh, Mezzalina. He married her in the year 38. Uh, and by her, he had a son who was eventually named Britannicus. Britannicus, you may recall, was the name he gave to his son in celebration 
of his military exploits in Britain. So it wasn't the original name for this child, but it became the nickname applied to him in celebration of his uh, labors there in Britain. So Britannicus was the first surviving son that had been born to Claudius. But unfortunately, uh, Valeria was also notoriously promiscuous. In this case, it was not a suspicion, it was an open known fact. And so he was so outraged when finally this thing had just gone over the top, he had her executed. So that was the end of her. And that brought probably the most notorious of all of his wives along, the fourth of them, known as Agrippina the Younger. So there's Agrippina the, Yo the Elder, who was the granddaughter of Augustus Caesar and the wife of Germanicus. And one of the four children born to Agrippina the Elder was Agrippina the Younger. Also Caligula was the brother, you know, and there were two others, Drusilla, you recall all of that from last week. So this is Agrippina the Younger. He married her in the year 49, the same year that he drove the Jewish people out of Rome, but there's no known connection. There she is. She had already been married, and her previous marriage had produced a young boy, bouncing baby boy, named Nero. And so Nero is brought into the family by virtue of this prior marriage, and Agrippina puts tremendous pressure on Claudius to not simply have him as a stepson, but to fully adopt him and make him indeed his full legal heir. As it turns out, Nero was older than Britannicus, and so as a result of that, it would put Nero ahead of Britannicus as a successor to the Roman throne should Claudius die. Well, as it turns out, Claudius began to suspect that this kid Nero was not such a uh, reliable character. You know, he saw even early on that Nero was given to some rather extraordinary displays of uh, instability, and he gradually began to distance himself from the son Nero and realign himself a little bit more with Britannicus. And Agrippina, his wife, lovely and charming lady that she was, decided that would never do, so she killed him. You know, that's just what you do when things aren't working out at home. And uh, this is not my Sunday school lesson for the day, please. That's so not, you know, uh, we'll save that for later. But anyway, she served him a nice little uh, lunch of mushrooms one day, and he got sick, and that was the end of Claudius. So good guy, a good ruler for the most part in terms of the emperors of, of uh, Rome, uh, one of the better ones. But he is put to death by Agrippina, his wife. And that does bring, of course, of course the most notorious of all of the Roman Caesars to the throne, Nero, whose story we will take up two weeks hence. So we'll be coming back and looking at him at that point. Biblical history that takes place under Claudius, I'll have to be somewhat rapid here, but we've already talked about Agrippa I. We mentioned him in connection with Caligula. This was the coinage that circulated under him. He'd been a close friend of Caligula. Claudius, when he became emperor in 41, actually expanded the holdings of Agrippa, so that all of those regions that had been held by his grandfather, Herod the Great, now came under the control of Agrippa I. Agrippa I was trying to ingratiate himself to the Jewish population, and he realized that these Christians were not very popular, so he arrested and killed James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve apostles, and then, of course, arrested Peter. And we looked at that story last week. Peter was miraculously rescued from prison, you recall, and that all took place probably early in the year 44. These all happened rather in rapid succession. In 44, Agrippa I was the one then, as we saw last week, who died for not disclaiming the worship that was being offered to him by these people as he was giving a public address. We went through all of that, but that took place early in the reign of uh, Claudius. The apostolic ministry during these years was significant. I've indicated to you that Paul's famine visit, mentioned in Galatians, mentioned in Acts, would have taken place about the year 44. And so he makes this trip, taking a gift to the saints in Jerusalem who are negatively affected. You see, they were already more or less disenfranchised from the economics of Jerusalem. Things like famines just made their lives much more miserable. So this was a gift from Gentile believers supporting Jewish believers in Jerusalem, and that was the reason for that visit. But he also had this brief meeting with the apostolic leadership in Jerusalem at that time.
He goes on his first missionary journey between the years of 46 and 47 under the reign of Claudius. You're familiar with this. It uh, goes down to Cyprus, up into central Turkey. He visits these cities, which were part of a region called Galatia. So Galatia had two different designations in the ancient world. The northern cities of Galatia were closer to Gaul. The southern cities were closer to uh, uh, the, what we would call the Holy Land or the uh, region of Turkey there. And both the term was applied to both, hence the southern Galatian and northern Galatian theories, you know. Uh, I believe that the churches that were part of the that were the recipients of the letter Paul wrote to the Galatians would have been these churches that are mentioned by name in the book of Acts, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and so on. In 48, after that first journey, Paul challenges Peter for his inconsistency. We read that in Galatians. In 49, Paul writes his letter to the Galatians. That would make this the first letter that Paul wrote. It's after the first journey, before the Jerusalem Council, Hence, he makes no specific reference to the Jerusalem Council in the book of Galatians. He is writing, however, to the Galatian churches because these characters known as Judaizers have come in and are trying to negatively influence the Galatian Christians toward a much more Jewish approach to their Christian faith than Paul believed was appropriate. Paul warns them specifically against circumcision. He says, if you are circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. You have fallen from grace. You know, that's the kind of language he uses in Galatians. Very forceful language. Then Paul goes to the Jerusalem council. He, of course, at that time, tells them of the experiences he's had on his first journey. The Jerusalem council, settling the question of the relationship between Gentile and Jew, issues a letter. And the letter essentially says to Gentile converts, you're not going to be required to be circumcised. None of those things are incumbent upon you. Just please, as a matter of deference, observe things like don't drink raw blood, you know, things that are highly offensive to Jewish people, and so on. So the letter is more a matter of just accommodating the two communities, but not imposing religious ritual requirements on the Gentile converts. Paul takes that letter, off he goes to the second journey, which is in 51 to 53, and I don't know how well you can see that map, not too well. Um, he takes the letter generated by the Jerusalem Council back to the churches in Galatia. And of course, they are overjoyed to hear that they're not going to be required to basically become good Jews before they can become good Christians. That's the tenor of it. He also picks up Timothy at this point and has him circumcised. And so this has, of course, caused some people to wonder, what is up with Paul? On the one hand, he's saying to people, if you're, if you're circumcised, Christ profits you nothing, and then he turns around and has Timothy circumcised. Now, what's, so I'd like to come back to that in just a moment. Uh, from there, he goes to Troas. He hears the Macedonian call. He goes across the Aegean Sea. He has his adventures in Macedon, you recall, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. I'm, I'm assuming you all are very familiar with the second missionary journey, so I'm just going through this lickety split. Here, but uh, Paul winds up in Athens, of course, then by himself. He preaches to the Athenian philosophers, the Stoics and the Epicureans, kind of Hellenistic philosophies, skeptical about the big questions, raising rather philosophically more questions of just how to be happy, how to get along in life, that kind of thing. They gave two different answers to essentially the same types of questions. This is an interesting sermon he preaches because it's the only time in Paul's ministry that we hear him addressing a completely pagan audience. Usually he's preaching to Jewish people and appeals to the Old Testament scriptures. Here, interestingly, he appears to, uh, appears to, to appeal to general revelation, a kind of natural theology. He appeals to their idol to the unknown God. He tries to expound the meaning of that. In other words, he's trying to find common ground with them in a sort of natural theological way. This is a fairly controversial idea that I'm saying here, but, but uh, that, at least it seems, is what he's doing. And so it's an interesting exercise. That's a picture I took of uh, Mars Hill. There are steps that go up the side of it, so Paul was probably standing about halfway up. Steps are to the right, or to the left on the picture as you're looking at it. And then he would have been talking down to these people gathered on the level spot there. If you notice off to the right, that kind of dark rectangular area is that. That's actually the text 
of Paul's letter. How many have been there? This is a kind of a popular place, so it's a wonderful. And if you read Greek, you can read Paul's letter or Paul's sermon to the Athenian philosophers right there. Uh, if you read Greek uh, in caps, by the way, it's all in caps. But uh, anyway, Paul goes from there to Corinth. That's where he meets Aquila and Priscilla, who had been forced out of Rome a couple of years earlier by Claudius. He also, while there, writes 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So if we're keeping track of Paul's letters, Galatians is first, then 1st Second Thessalonians. Uh, Thessalonians, and then probably just a few months later, 2 Thessalonians, written during the same stay in Corinth. He was kind of straightening out some eschatological confusion in the Thessalonian church. That seems to be what drove that letter. He returns to Antioch through Jerusalem, and that's the end of that conversation. And I apologize, I feel like I've been just, you know, running a little too fast here. Uh, but I did want to get to our thought for the morning, which has to do with this whole question of uh, Timothy. So, uh, if you are interested in this, we're back in uh, Galatians, or I'm sorry, in uh, Acts chapter 16 and this incident where Paul has Timothy circumcised. And this leads me to my Sunday school lesson for the morning. Here it is. Point one, when it came to principle, Paul was emphatic on this issue of circumcision and it stands for a broader idea that there are some things in our lives upon which there are some hills we should be willing to die on, you see. This was one Paul was willing to die on. If the question was, do you need to be circumcised in order to be saved, which was exactly what the Judaizers were saying, then at that point Paul was going to draw a line in the sand that is absolutely uh, verboten. It's not going to be the case. He would not tolerate any idea heading along those lines. And the book of Galatians, of course, makes that abundantly clear. And it says to us that there are certain points where we, in principle, should say, nope, I cannot compromise this. There's much in the Christian faith that is susceptible to compromise. There are many points where we should be flexible. There are some points where we should not be flexible. There are some points where we should say, this principle cannot be yielded, no matter how much political pressure is being placed upon us to do so. Then you have other uh, you know, issues that come along. Why did Paul have Timothy circumcised? Certainly not for the salvation of his soul, but because Timothy and Paul and Silas were going to be moving heavily in a Jewish community. They were going to be constantly going to the synagogue. And one of the first things that would happen, the way the culture ran in the first century, was if a person was not circumcised, he couldn't even enter the synagogue, let alone have a ministry among these Jewish people. And Paul was going to say, if it's a matter of getting access to people to preach the gospel to them, I will bend over backwards, I'll do anything that I have to do in order to get into that place to have a hearing. And if it means having somebody circumcised for that reason only, to not give offense, to just simply create an opportunity for ministry, then by all means, we'll circumcise Timothy for that purpose. It's a very big difference, isn't it? It's one thing to say this is a matter of principle related to the message of the gospel. It's another thing to say, to what degree do I need to flex in order to win access to human beings to preach the gospel to them? I heard one guy on this very point say once upon a time, Paul was willing to be anybody's doormat as long as they got their feet clean. You see, Paul was willing to compromise at any point his convenience uh, across the board. He was willing to, as long as it didn't reach the fundamental truth of the gospel, and there all of a sudden you were dealing with a rock-solid, immovable object in that same Apostle Paul. If matters were matters that were negotiable or uncertain, matters indifferent as they're sometimes called, Paul was willing to be flexible. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own heart, he says in Romans 14. But when it came to the heart of the matter, the heart of the gospel, that's where he drew the line, no compromise there. I'm afraid our tendency, my tendency, I don't know about you, is to get it backwards. I tend to get rock solid, rigid, immovable over things that don't matter that much. And then when I ought to be really strong and principled and courageous, I wilt like a leaf. You ever been, felt that way? The things that matter, we tend to compromise. The things that don't matter so much, we tend to become stubborn 
and irrationally resolute about the minor things. Let's just get it backwards. Let's get it the way it should be, you know. As Christian people, let's be strong where we need to be strong. Let's be flexible where we should be flexible. And that brings us to the third point, that the only way to resolve that apparent conflict, these two practices, is to keep our eyes focused on the one great reality that brings it all together, and that is Christ himself. Because Paul's focus on the person of Christ and his call was clear. He knew when to refuse to circumcise. He also knew when to circumcise. Because finally, the thing made sense in Christ. Now, circumcision may not be the big issue on our agenda these days, but there are things that are, aren't there? There are issues circulating right now in our culture, in our church, and there are places where we as Christian people are called to be people of deep principle. And there are places where we are called to be those who are willing to flex and to do whatever is necessary to simply win a hearing for the gospel. I'm not going to jump into particulars. I'm going to let you wrestle with that in your own conscience. But you understand the difference. We all have to deal with that, especially as Presbyterians. We have to be you know, facing those kinds of issues, those kinds of dilemmas. And I hope the example that's given to us by the Apostle Paul gives us some help and guidance along those lines.